Okay, today is the second part of the training uh, um, about dealing with the highly traumatized people and uh, vulnerable group in no clinical context. So we start uh, about talking uh, ways people cope with trauma and the focus on vulnerable groups. And after uh, we concentrate on the relationship with highly traumatized persons in no, con in no clinical context, do and don't. And we, at the end, uh, um, talk a little about the vicarious trauma and secondary traumatization, because it can be uh, an effect of working with a highly traumatized person. So we start with the ways people cope with trauma. We have two basic psychological defense mechanisms denial and minimizing. Denial is a mechanism which uh, unpleasant thoughts, feelings, wishes, or events are ignored or excluded from conscious awareness. It may take uh, such form as a refusal of acknowledged reality of a terminal, Ill of a terminal illness or financial problem, an addiction, or a partner's infidelity. Okay, denial is an unconscious process that functions to resolve emotional conflict or reduce anxiety. In all daily life, we use denial as a mechanism, and we use it in an automatic way, and we say, it doesn't exist, it doesn't be true, I don't believe in it, uh, is a, another way of see the reality. And after we have a minimization, is consisting of a tendency to present events to oneself or others as insignificant or unimportant. Minimization often involves being unclear or not specific, so the listener doesn't have a complete picture of all the details and may be led by drawing inaccurate or incomplete conclusion. It's not so important. Talking about it, it's a waste of time. It's not so uh fundamental right talk about this so uh these two um normal mechanism could be uh, if exasperated could create it pathological response to reality mm? The common response to atrocities is to banish them, eliminate them from consciousness. This is a very famous sentence of uh, Erm, Judith Herman. Judith Herman is the author of Trauma and Recovery and is a, a very revolutionary book for the, uh, for the ages of publishing because uh, they talk about trauma and uh, this mechanism of denial and minimization that belongs not only uh, to the victim, because it's too hard, uh, the event uh, who, have, who has experienced that I try to banish uh, from uh, uh, the consciousness, but also for the abuser and perpetrator that uh, say that uh, he, he, he says as I'm, such as uh, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. Is not violence. Is only conflict. Is not something so significant. And also for the third party, the people the others, the workers, the network of institutional actors. We have all in common something because atrocity is too painful 
uh, to, 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 to watch, to observe, to listen, to hear. So we try to banish, uh, to eliminate uh, with the denial and the minimization uh, mechanism. When I feel scared, what is your pers what is my personal safe place? Uh, I ask you if you want to share, um, think about your fear and write on chat your personal safe place. If I think about my uh, fears, I think that my personal self place is my home. Or oh, in specific is my bedroom because it is a place, an intimate place of myself where I can uh, start, restart from thinking about myself. And what about your personal self place? Someone want to ask, uh, answer to these questions. What is your personal safe place? Okay, it's the bedroom. <laughs> I would say bedroom as well, but also I think that you that for me, a safe place becomes when I, I am with certain people, okay. A little island in, in Finland, a small cottage, my home, okay. It's important to have in our mind the idea of a safe place because when there is a three-thing world outside of us, we can have a, a safe place in our mind to relax ourselves and to find ourselves again. Another question, maybe another answer for me is being in this moment with certain people. Oh, nice. Okay, now a dynamic process of being a refugee. Okay, by definition, a refugee has been displaced from his home. In addition to problems caused by displacement, refugees suffer with issues surrounding identity, belonging, and along with them, internal psychological homeostasis. People displaced to new countries with the new languages to learn, and most always have a less empowered social political status and have some challenging as re establishing a place, restructuring identity, and regaining a sense of belonging is just that much more difficult. To be without your place uh, in searching of, of a new place uh, is very a challenging aspect. Place uh, as a way of defining the immediate and intimate portion of the environmental unit outside the of person. Place and home can be thought as a, a geographic center which facilitates attachment, development, and identity and survival. Stable and optimal place offers the best chance for a homeostatic environment. Disruptions to place threaten homeostasis by alterating attachments, familiarity, and place identity and maybe result in psychological problems of nostalgia, disorientation, and alienation. So it's important to have the stable place outside of us, as inside of us. Loss of place not only affects people's sense of identity and belonging, but it also 
an identified risk factor for poor mental health. But be careful because we have a paradox. In the refugees' experiences, there are culture shock, loneliness, physical mundaneness, grief, nostalgia, and feelings of dejection, humiliation, inferiority. The refugees reported also feeling of relief and safety after leaving behind the threat of death in their old homes, feeling of gratefulness for the new freedom to hope for a better life and the restored ability to notice beauty, as well as a sense of normalcy in their new life. So we have in front of ambiguous paradox situation with two different opposite polarities. Grief, feeling of dejection, humiliation, relief, safety from the other part. So which of these two polarities is it more difficult to see for me when I'm dealing with the highly traumatized person? Because we have a clear idea that we in a, is a, a the migration and the refugees, the asylum seekers are uh, involved in a big humanity phenomenon. Um, with the contradictory parts. Uh, uh, so we have to uh, sometimes, if you see, if we see only the weakness, uh, the vulnerability, uh, we lose uh, the other parts, uh, the, the relief, the safety, the hope, the res resilience part of these uh, people. So we have to be, uh, a bilance, we have to put in a balance uh, uh, position ourselves to see the weakness, but to see also, also the strength, to see the pain, but also to see uh, the hope. Okay, when I meet a refugee, an asylum seeker, a migrant, I also deal with his, her needs, truth fears and fate. Start with needs. There are some practical needs, permission and internal needs, expressing fear associated with the experience, support. And what about my needs in the relationship? What are my needs in the relationship uh, with uh, uh, refugees, with migrants, with, with vulnerable groups. It's important to start to recognize my needs and also the, uh, the needs of the other. For example, I need to confront with someone of the project, of the staff, I need to elaborate my feelings. These are questions that we don't have to find the answer today now, but you have to put these questions while you are doing your work in the project. What about my needs in that relationship? About the truths of traumatic experiences, violence, war, torture. Do you believe me could be a, and a questions of a, a refugee, women, men, girls, boys? Do you believe me? I want to go for a word. I don't want to talk. I'm here. I don't want to talk about my pre-migration uh, circumstances or uh, about the uh, flight process. 
I'm here, I don't want, I want to go forward, I don't want to talk. Or oh, the narration of the pre-flight process or the process itself could be contradictory. This is not an indicator of lying, but an effect of trauma, because we remember from the last training that trauma can create some uh, problem with the memories or um, the, the dissociation. So uh, is something that I split off the emotional side from the cognitive side. So uh, can, can the, an, effort, an effort can be a contradictory um, narration. So let's start with, I will let, no, let's start. <laughs> we, we come back to us. Mm. What is your reaction of this different case? What is your re reaction when a refugee uh, asks, Do you believe me? I believe, I respect, I have some doubt, I don't believe him, here, here is, it's important uh, that you um, concentrate on your reaction of the tra truth of traumatic experience. What about fears? About uh, maybe a refugee, a woman, a auxilium seeker has fears about uh, who are you and your role, or about uh, your judgment, or about uh, your power? How do you scare it of this relationship with other life culture? Because if uh, uh, to the other person uh, there are fears about who are you, your role, your judgment, your power. What about your fears about the others, uh, and other life, and other culture, and other trauma? Building trust and relationship is a process, and starting also with asking to yourself some, some questions. is not only the role to do questions to the others, but to start questioning yourself. Okay, <clears throat> the relationship with highly traumatized person, we start with some indications of psychology of communication. We have uh, the five axioms of communication of Václavic, is a classical uh, uh, of uh, communication, of psychology of communication. The first uh, uh, axiom is one cannot not communicate. Okay, what uh, means? Activity or inactivity, words or silence, all, all, all have message value. Because if I stay in silence, is I want to communicate something to my listener. A activity or inactivity, words of or silence have uh, they influence others, and these others in turn cannot not respond to this communication, and are themselves communicating. So if I say a word. I communicate something and the other re-communicate to my word uh, in, a, in a certain way, also in a non-verbal non way, but uh, we no one cannot not communicate. The second is every communication as a content and a relationship aspect. Content refer refers to the actual subject matter of what is being discussed today. Uh, we discuss it about the issue of trauma. 
the relationship level of communicative act has to do with how the two communicators view one another and how they convey it. We discuss with today with the issue of the trauma and the communication with highly traumatized people in a context of a training when, a, when there, where there is a trainer uh, and um, other people that listening what uh, the trainer uh, said. The third axiom is that the nature of a relationship is dependent on the punctuation of the partner's communication procedures. It is concerned how participants in the system punctuate the communicative sequence. In a communicative event, every item in the sequence is seamlessly a stimulus, a response, a reinforcement, stimulus, response, and reinforcement. Therefore, one can interpret an act as the beginning a response. I don't trust you because you don't share your feelings with me while the other can interpret it as a being a stimulus. I don't share my feelings with people that don't trust me. So you, it's, it's very different uh, the interpretation, uh, but the sequence is a stimulus response reinforcement. Communication can be both digital and analogical. The digital code is what the person say, what the words actually mean, while the analogic code has to do with how something is said or the non-verbal cues that go along with it. So be careful because, because the analogical level is very important in, in, in some um, contexts, more than the, the, the digital level, because a cognitive level, digital level, um, verbal level um, is important, but what uh, is the real meaning is uh, another level, is the analogical code, is the no verbal code, and we have to be careful in a context of communication with uh, intercultural uh, situation uh, to also to the level, to analogical level. Okay, the last axiom is interhuman communication procedures are either symmetric or complementary. This simply means that either the participants in the system are on equal ground with regards to power relation or one of them is over the other. So we are a context that is not clinical, but is an interculture and the symmetric is the aim of our um, work, but is not the, a, a basic, uh, a base of our work because we are in asymmetric situation um, only for uh, the use of language, only for the um, situation of our uh, role, the other person, refugees uh, and uh, auxilium seekers or uh, migrants, people are in uh, um, situation not symmetric with us. So we have to be careful about uh, not to abuse of this position, not only at the level of communication, but also for, every, for other things as a, a power um, role we play in the in the project in the, in the work 
Okay, another thing to take into account is stereotypes. Going behind stereotypes because stereotypes uh, must be monitoring and be, uh, to don't become stigma, stigmas. Stereotypes is an overgeneralized belief about a peculiar category of people and influence expectations about the group's personality, preference, appearance, or ability. Now, it's not a negative stereotype because we, uh, in life, we, we, we can uh, know everything uh, in every uh, area uh, of uh, life. So we uh, use uh, our, our mind, use stereotypes. The problem is when stereotypes is so rigid and influence my expectations uh, my uh, ideas of uh, uh, a, a group's personality, a preference, appearance, or ability. And uh, if it is too rigid, become a stigma or real, a strong feeling of disapproval that most people in a society have about something. So, I give you here a list of some stereotypes from women to women. We, I give you some example, but uh, it's not only from the part of uh, women and girls, uh, auxilium seeker or refugees, but also some stereotypes about the counselors of domestic violence, uh, Italian Councillor of Domestic Violence, uh, European Council of Domestic Violence, because it is from a project um, of, about domestic violence and gender violence on um, women uh, and girls auxilium seeker refugees. And uh, we start the relationship with the, uh, uh, the, from women to women to understand the stereotypes uh, um, in, uh, uh, that are in, uh, uh, on, uh, on the relationship. So start with some common stereotypes uh, about women with our eyes of uh, uh, Italian counselor for domestic violence. Maybe we can recognize stereotypes as uh, they are poor. They want all and immediately. They don't say truth because they want to obtain some auxilium, some help, some permission. They have a lot of children. They are dependent of men. They are not educated. So this could be uh, the medium uh, women and men um, that watch uh, women and girls auxilium seeker refugees. Now we have uh, at the opposite, some common stereotypes about uh, counselors of domestic violence, Italian, white uh, women uh, that are um, stereotyped stereoty stereoty uh, by, uh, with the eyes of the girls and women, auxilium seeker refugees. They can think, uh, they can think about us uh, that we are not really women because they don't have children or they or we don't uh, have uh, want to have. Um, they think that we are always on diet and uh, we don't know the pleasure of life. They can think that we judge our life and culture and they think that uh, we know what is all right and for, for them. So be careful to recognizing stereotypes 
they could be a trap to go in touch with others. Okay, I just want to give you some uh, notions about intersectionality. Okay, discrimination is treating an individual or a group of people differently because of an element of their social group. Intersectionality is a term developed by feminist scholar Kimberly Campbell uh, Crenshaw to highlight the importance of understanding the intersection of racism and sexism in black women's life. Now use more broadly to refer to mul multiply uh, identities and the inter interconnection of various system of oppression. Oppression what it is, is a system structures and power relationship woven throughout social institution as well as embedded within individual consciousness that characteristics or membership of a social group. A newcomer may experience oppression based on one social category or group to which they belong. For example, their ethnicity, but may experience privilege based on another, for example, the sexual orientation. Privilege is unearned social power. We don't earn the social power of our privilege accorded by the formal or informal situation of social of society of society to members of a dominant groups. Okay, there is diversity within diversity. Although it is important to consider the social categories of groups uh, that an individual might may identify with, uh, it is just as important not to assume that all members of that group uh, will share similar experiences or perspective. Systems and structures of discrimination and oppression are linked in order to work to combat the barriers that newcomers face. It is important to see how their experiences may be impacted by multiple parts of the identity. Okay, this is a, a graphic we explain what is intersectionality? A larger societal, societal forces and structure, immigration system, historical factor. After, as a, um, there is a, a form of oppression and discrimination, racism, homophobia. In the inner circle, is markers of difference and social categories, gender, age, immigration, status, and the inner circle is unique circumstance and personal experience. I want to see, okay, let you, I want to show um, just, the explanation of what is uh, intersectionality about this uh, video. No. Migliaia di bambini stanno morendo. This video, just one moment. Okay. Intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. 
Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory. It's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem. It's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom, between teachers and students, between students and other students, between students and administrators, and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students, regardless of their identities. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit. It is a relationship between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development, to opportunities in the school for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. Okay. Now, uh, what can I do? Um, I want that you, I want, I would like to stimulate to take this uh, intersectionality uh, point of view. First of all, check your privilege and look behind just skin color, middle class, university level education, able-bodied, cisgender, all your social identities play into your privilege, even if you didn't ask for it. Reflect on this and consider how this impacts the discriminations you do on that experience. Listen and learn. And its very core intersectionality is about learning and understanding views from other. Listen to include and meaningfully collaborate with diverse groups of people. Hear and honor their words, but remember it's not your response, it's not the responsibility of marginalized group to do all the work in educating people on their experience. This often takes up lots of emotional labor and should never be taken for granted. So be prepared to help undertake some of the labor by doing your own research. Make space, ask yourself if you are the right person to take up space or speak on certain issues. Don't speak for them, don't speak over them. Watch your language. So many of the words we use every day are ableist, exclusionary, and downright offensive to marginalized communities. Accept criticism and call others out. As we become more intersectional and better at understanding differences, our language evolve to simply reflecting experiences from people of singular identity. So be careful about language. Okay, so we have to be careful of context. It is in the, when we talk about dealing with highly traumatized uh, people in no in non clinical context. So, it is individual or it is a group situation uh, because it is individual session, it is an individual um, uh, count, counseling session not for all, for, um, but uh, it is a, an individual space, an interview, or is a group situation. The social context may be influencing the refugees' priorities and decision. Establish clear expectations and explain what is possible and what is not. It is not clinical context. He, she, 
is welcome to talk, but if it is a request for psychological help, that is not the right place. Evaluate your own nonverbal behavior, the importance of the verbal behavior, and ensure that your body language and physical action are culturally sensitive. Consider the nonverbal behavior of the person as well as cultural differences and his or her background. Consider that the culture group place different meaning to nonverbal cues, thus do not generalize across the group or individual. Okay, what's happen if someone express anger? Because as we see the next time, uh, could, it could be possible that traumatized people manifest, manifest state, express anger. So what happened if uh, express anger with you? Be patient and, uh, and allow time for the full expression of anger. You are, don't be afraid, don't be scared of anger, expression of anger. Um, remember that acceptance of the other's emotion creates trust. It means I'm here, I can understand, I can uh, uh, listen to your anger and carefully summarize angry remarks to focus or to underline feelings and needs. Why you are so angry with the me is not me is is anger with the situation and understand that you are anger in the situation not with me it's important this uh, um, for you remember that the anger is likely a made at the situation not at you show respect but pretend also respect anger is not aggressive or is not always aggressive. So uh, if you, someone aggressive you, assault you is another uh, situation and you have to put and to set limit. But you are not afraid about anger. Ask questions if it is necessary to facilitate exchange of information and to clear up misunderstanding in order to make sure that the refugees' concerns have been un understood. Don't be um, afraid of um, questioning, always with respect. Okay, responding to a disclosure of traumatic events. Last time, someone uh, told us that uh, women in a group situation talked about uh, gender violence uh, experience, uh, experiences in, uh, uh, in, this, in a family situation. Okay, what can we do about uh, uh, the disclosure of traumatic events that could be violence, that could be torture, that could be um, war, that could be all the fried processing. Acknowledge the person's experience and its associated pain. This will help to validate the person's reaction. That's terrible thing you have been through. We have to validate, the important to validate the person's reaction is not your cessation, it's real a big thing you have to, um, to experience. Remind the person that the reaction is a characteristic response to the circumstance. For example, it is common for survival to blame themselves see their reactions as a sin 
that they are, that they are abnormal or weak. So it's a norm in your situation to express these feelings. Is not a, your individual, your personal response, is a characteristic response to the circumstance. It can be, uh, it can, it have been happening this. Okay, avoid false reassurance, please. This is important because uh, uh, instilling hope uh, is important, but not uh, creating illusions. It's not all, you don't have, and also clini uh, clinicians, people, uh, helpers, uh, professional, uh, professional helpers, uh, nobody has a magical, uh, um, a magical uh, uh, solution uh, or can do miracles. So it's not, um, it's impossible to uh, re assurance of what happens or what will it will be but uh, uh, we can indicate that with the time and appropriate support improvement can be achieved so instill hope but we must be realistic it's hard it's a hard journey but it can be can be happen that you are free from violence, from trauma, from uh, uh, traumatic events. You can't change your past, it's impossible. Nobody can change the experience of the past, but uh, you can manage to live a better, to, a better life today and in the future. You have to expect that the person who has disclosed a painful event one day may be unwilling to talk about it in, sub in subsequent moment. Rather than pushing them to do so, talk about other things that may be troubling them in the here and now. Okay, you don't stimulate the person to, the person to talk about the traumatic events. If he or she talks about the trauma, well, we can, uh, you, you can listen, but not only uh, talking, uh, is the talking or the trauma is the only way talk and retalk and retalk, or the only way to elaborate. It's important to nominate the trauma, but uh, we have also do talk and do about other aspects we have to uh, working on. Expect inconsistencies in the person's retelling in the trauma history. Mm? Attention on rejecting irresponses verbally or non verbally. Changing the subject why she or he. Uh, talking about something, uh, ignoring your message, remain silent, avoiding answering questions. If uh, she or er, uh, if she or he uh, asks uh, questions about trauma and you don't, uh, uh, you don't have a, a answer, take time or. Um, stimulate the persons to ask help uh, about uh, this uh, situation, but uh, non, but is important uh, that you uh, don't remain silent or you don't uh, take the message. Attention appearing confused or becoming too defensive, arguing or expressing anger no examining the relevance of the feelings. Be careful of this. So this was uh, the, the it was uh, uh, a slide of the last time, but is important to reread together. 
space allow time for the survivor to come down and take perspective. Trauma survivors often have difficulty regulating emotion and take longer to calm down. Recalibration, read overreact, overreacting, oversensitive, over anything from your vocabulary. Attribution, don't refer to the person's upbringing, problems, issues, behavior. Call it for what is it? Trauma. Reciprocity. Reciprocity and symmetric situation, symmetric communication. Give what you also need to receive. Listening, empathy and empower and support, but be kind, loving, patient, but empathically set limits you have needs too so remember the this balance i'm here i can listen but my role is another role and i can support in another way so name the traumatic event and the tra and the trauma response you live, you have experience of violence, you have experience of war, you have experience of flight process. And for this, you have a trauma response. You uh, sometimes um, do uh, uh, nightmares or have flashbacks. So I believe you, I respect, I believe you, and validate the experiences, but set limits because uh, uh, you are not a counselor, you are not a professional helper, um, helper. you are not psychology, you are not psychiatric, um, your work and your role is uh, another. Okay, this is another, the last uh, aspect that I want to uh, examine with you, that the, is the vicarious trauma or secondary traumatization. Vicarious trauma is uh, an occupational challenge for people working and volunteering in the fields of victim services, law enforcement, emergency medical services, fire services, and other profession due to the continuous exposure to victims to trauma and violence. Mm. So this work-related trauma exposure can occur from such experiences as a listening to individual clients recount their victimization or look at the video of exploit children, review case files, hearing about responding to the aftermath of violence, of other traumatic events day after day. So I get illness to listening the trauma of other people. So work-related trauma exposure could be uh, involved in vicarious trauma with two consequences. One in change in world view. And this is a, could be a positive because you can be inspired by um, the resilience of people who have experience of trauma, but also in a spectrum of responses from positive to negative. Uh, in the middle, we find the natural um, response. A natural response is the impact managed in an effectively way. Positive could be a vicarious resilience. I, I see uh, the resilience of these vulnerable people and uh, I learn from them to be resilient vicarious transformation, compensation, satisfaction, but also in negative. Vicarious traumatization, secondary traumatic stress, and compassion fatigue. So it's important to put limit, to set boundaries. 
who is at the risk of be affected by vicarious trauma, prior traumatic experiences, social isolation, both on and off the job, a tendency to avoid feelings, withdraw and assign uh, blame to the other stressful situation, uh, the, the denial, if I always denial uh, as a mechanism of self-defense, uh, at the end, in the chronic way, I avoid the feelings, I avoid the, 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 the contact with my emotions and could be a risk to be affected to vicarious trauma. Difficulty expressing feelings, lack of preparation, orientation, training, and supervision in their job. Be newer employees and less experience in their jobs is important in this the mentoring. So constant intensive exposure to trauma with little or no variation in work task. Lack, lack of effective and supportive process for discussing trauma context, content uh, of the work. Suggestion for co-workers. What happens, what can I do if I see a co-worker uh, a friend's uh, um, at risk of vicarious trauma. Reaching out and talking to them individually about the impact of the work. Encouraging them to attend to the basics, sleep, healthy eating, hygiene, as exercises, supporting connection with families, friends, and co-workers referring them to the organizational supports. Okay, at the end, protecting yourself while you work, putting your own boundaries. A question, when you are tired at work after listening and working and listening trauma, uh, traumatic events, uh, traumatic experience, ask yourself, what good can I do for myself today? And what is my safe space? I answer to, my, to, the, to, to this question that today uh, I'm going to uh, my counseling session with four women and at the, 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 the end of the day, for me, uh, I uh, watch a movie I want to, to see. And it's, it's a, a little gift for today. So when uh, um, we are very tired, uh, full of details, full of emotion, full of dynamics, uh, um, of pain uh, um, dynamics, uh, painful dynamics, we can every day have a little gift to improve also my safe space, my home, my island, my special, special um, space in the world. Improve your resilience, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, to inspiration found in your privileged observatory of humanity. At the last, I want to, pre to if you don't know, uh, to uh, show a little uh, video um, to, uh, of this uh, uh, famous Arthur. She is an author of uh, a famous uh, uh, book. Um, that is called Vagina Monologue, and uh, um, she is a survivor of uh, um, sexual uh, violence by his father. And I want to show this uh, three minutes uh, video to understand what is the resilience and what can be important to be inspired uh, 
from this person to improve ourselves. I realized that in this time that we're living in, I've heard so many women speak out about what's happened to them. In that time, I was just thinking, nobody has written an apology. I grew up in a family where from the time I was five, my father sexually abused me, and then at 10, he began to batter me almost murdering me a couple of times. And that went on and on every day, every day. So I think what I discovered is through writing this, I could take this vice of me being victim, my father being perpetrator, and begin to return it in another direction so that the perpetrator became an aware person. The perpetrator became an apologist. The perpetrator became a person who was willing to take responsibility. So my life has been through my writing, through my work, through my love of women, through my belief in women, a real desire to figure out uh, the path to our liberation. How do we get out of that cage? Well, I never think about my life in terms of my career, to be honest with you. I think of my life in terms of evolving a consciousness. I think this book probably took me 65 years to write, or 60, and I think I had to go through a lot of stages to get here. You know, I became very self-destructive. In those years of really going down the drain, I almost killed myself because I wanted his approval so much. And there just came a point in my life where I suddenly realized, you're not gonna get his approval, ever. And you have to make a decision as a woman whether you approve of yourself. And it took a lot of years to develop that muscle. It was really very um, harrowing to climb into my father's head and his consciousness and to allow him into me to see why he did what he did. And then for him to really be very specific because liberation is in the details. When we, someone can say, I did this and this and this to you, that's where we get liberated. My life has radically changed since I wrote this book. We think that if we go to the most dangerous, scary place, it's gonna kill us. For me, to go into a place where I felt my father and felt his feelings was the scariest place I could have gone because my defense against my father for so long was he was just a monster, he was a horrible person. But I knew someplace that wasn't true because I loved my father. He was my father, but it was the most liberating. What it taught me is go to what you're most afraid of because that's where freedom lies. What I hope is that it's a blueprint for men where they will feel compelled to make apologies. And I hope for women, if they can't get apologies from their perpetrators, they will feel able and willing and supported in writing those apologies to themselves and the words that they needed to hear. It takes so long to recover from childhood sexual abuse and from sexual abuse and from domestic violence and from any kind of harassment. And I think part of what we have to do as women is really rewrite that story because it takes work, but of course you can recover from your story. We are resilient, powerful women and we can be anyone we wanna be. And it's just a question of having the right tools, having the right process for you to get out of the despair of what somebody has put on you. It's a process. And everybody moves at their own speed and everybody has breakthroughs when they have breakthroughs and there's no prescribed way there's tools this book is an offering of a tool it doesn't mean everybody has to do this this is for who who it resonates with okay just one moment okay uh, liberation is in the tales. I like very much this uh, sentence, and also is not uh, uh, is not a way to liberate from trauma, um, but also uh, to empower the, res the resilience. So um, I uh, the, this uh, sentence. Uh, uh, by Alan de Botton say that a good half of the art of living is resilience. So uh, resilience is our uh, aim, our achieve. Um, and um, so uh, with, uh, at the end, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, don't worry about uh, your uh, fear to deal with uh, highly traumatized people. Um, because uh, um, the importance is to connect with your inner 
um, world uh, or safe place uh, and to talk about. Uh, we can nominate, uh, validate, uh, uh, and also uh, as a part of the right process uh, to um, elaborate this traumatic event. Thank you very much, Francesca, for this interesting excursus and path that, as you have said, start from ourselves to be ready and dealing with the person in, who's living in difficult circumstances. Uh, I would like to ask if uh, among the participants there, there are uh, questions for uh, Francesca. Lisa, are you, have you some questions for Francesca? No, I think it was really interesting and I just wanted to say, say thank you because there, there were so many doubts that uh, this lesson has taught us and the uh, new things we have learned so this is very useful because to be quite honest sometimes because we don't have the the background of psychological education and uh, there are so many things that you have an intuition how to react or how to do the things and sometimes you do it right but sometimes you don't because you the intuition is sometimes a bad advisor so it is very good to have these uh, tools to our reactions and how to behave with the uh, victims of violence uh, in our working environment. So thank you very much, Francesca. It's a pleasure. And uh, don't worry because uh, um, make mistake, making mistake is the only way to know and uh, to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> it's difficult for us that we are trained to the professional uh, help, uh, um, helper. Uh, we are a professional helper and we are, always uh, make uh, mistakes. The importance is to reflect and to start uh, from uh, our uh, feelings, emotion. If something is not uh, uh, in the right, uh, uh, in the right uh, feelings. Uh, if I feel that something is wrong, uh, um, you don't. I don't put uh, away, but uh, um, try to um, understand what happens and what indicate to myself this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So if there are no further questions, we, I will uh, thank Francesca once again and uh, all of you to having been here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.